Hi, I'm Dallas Brown from the American Hot Rod Association and welcome to our introductory video for the American Hot Rod Association Drag Racing History Channel. That sounds impressive and big. <laughs> but it is impressive and big. We put a, we took the entire AHRA archive, which was three pieces of notebook paper and a sticky pad, and we threw it all out here. Nice. Where is it? Uh, uh, we're going to go through it. That's the whole point. Oh, you okay. and I. We're going to discuss You're going to invite me along for the, for the journey through exactly. the history of the AHRA. Well, for those of you who don't know, this is Tony DeFeo from Uncle Tony's Garage. And he has a very steeped history in drag racing uh, pretty much from the 80s all the way through the 90s and 2000s, right? I've ensured that drag strips will never rust from coast to coast. <laughs> <laughs> well, perfect. So leave your rear main seals out and we're going to get into some history for the American Hot Rod Association that covers broad topics from pivotal things that happened in history that changed the direction of the sport or equipment that was developed well, or well, engineered. Why don't, we, why don't we bring our people up to speed here and give me a brief history of the AHRA. What is the AHRA? Where did it come from? Who started it? Okay. How did you end well, up with it? Well, and, and that's an interesting story all by itself. But okay. originally 1950s, 1955, Walt Mentor from Pennsylvania created the American Hot Rod Association. He was drafted into the military. Um, and then it kind of sat around for a little bit, was picked up by Jim Tice. And Jim Tice was a racer. Um, he attended the very first um, uh, U.S. Nationals in Great Bend, Kansas. Okay. 1955. In, in 55. Okay. And he was treated terribly. Him and his wife were racers and they were treated horribly at the track. Wait a minute, you're saying the, the NHRA mistreated racers? I don't know, it seems to be a running gag. <laughs> so. What happened was, Jim said, we can do it better. We can definitely do it better. So he took the AHRA, moved it to Kansas, where he was home, uh, home, home based out of, and then started the Sportsman Racer Friendly uh, American Hot Rod Association. Okay. And that was 1950? That would have been 56, I think, when he was running it. Okay. But then the Nitro bid happened. The Nitro Band Fifty Seven. Right. So the HR was kind of like a club, really. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a, a force to be reckoned with until the NHRA decided, in its infinite wisdom, because it always makes these very, you know, <laughs> Great good decisions, decisions. Right. Right. That nitromethane had no place, and not just nitromethane, because back in the day, back in the, the 50s, actually even into the 60s, they considered alcohol fuel. Also, fuel was anything that wasn't pump gas. So they had the Institute the Fuel Band in 1957. So at that point, a lot of like name racers, and a lot of them, especially were, that were grouped in, in the, the Southern California area, right. around Lions Drag Strip, which is, that's another video, it's a whole story. <laughs> all by itself. Right. They all grouped up under the AHRA banner, and that's when things really took off, because if you wanted to see top fuel, there was no such thing as NHRA top fuel. NHRA had top eliminator. Top eliminator. Right. AHRA is where Top Fuel came from, and uh, from there it, it just exploded, and it was the major competitor against the National Hot Rod Association all the way through pretty much 1984 when it was Jim Tice said passed, right. and the association disappeared. It went through a smattering of people that attempted to run or resurrect the, the association. Well, and actually, it really it ran it ran the AHRA ran head to head with the NHRA right up until the Winston money really. When, when NHRA got the Winston money in 1873, that's really kind of like when it started to leave the AHRA behind in the dust, because the AHRA didn't have a, a big series sponsor. Right. So it didn't have the, the TV time, it didn't have all of the stuff that... It took know, to go to the next level. Right, right. right. But, but during the glory days, the right. 1960s and the early 1970s, the coolest stuff on the planet was happening under the AHRA amount. Right, well, that's where Pro Stock was developed. Right. right for heads up super stock class in 68 yeah pro stock. Yeah. So people think pro stock is an nhra development that's a actually, name it's right <laughs> it's a name but ahra had the gt classes right right uh and super stock classes and pro stock came from from a, like all it originally developed from those two classes and then built into what is now known as pro stock but it was heads up super stock is where it started right so um but there was also the unique classes. Uh, the AHRA used to have a mantra that said, if you show up at one of our races, 
with a car that doesn't fit in class. We will make one on the spot so you can run. And they didn't want to leave the regular racer behind. The whole idea was to give everybody the opportunity to race because they're all standing in line for the same thing. They want to go down the track. They had a lot of unusual classes, so like within the GT classes. Right. They had like two barrel. Well, they had your formula classes. And the formula and, classes. Right. You could virtually have almost any combination of car, and there was a class for you in the formula. Right. But they specifically had like the, the formula classes, like for they because they had basically pro stock motors running off a two barrel carburetor. <laughs> well, yes, later in the years, that's exactly yeah. what was going on. There was a lot of crazy stuff. Because, again, see, they wanted to have a place, a venue for anybody. If you were left out of, out of the NHRA program, you know, you could find a home racing in the in the AHRA. Yeah, and it was all, it was, there was no class leaving anyone out based off of money. That was the whole idea. That's why you had a two-barrel motor that had, that's, they had the option to run virtually a stock car in that class. Would they be competitive? Probably not. You know, but uh, it gave you the option to have that low buck, you know, family and racer centric organization. And that's what it's always been uh, pretty much from the beginning. And that's why I felt that we needed to go back to that because we were leaving that so far behind that they were, electronics was running the show and you were having two groups of the haves and the have nots. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we created the basic common man's heads up classes that pretty much made it where all the have-nots can run, and if you're a have, sorry, take the equipment off, and now you're a have-not. Right, so you're foot brake only, no and electronics. We, we do uh, no electronics, a, a lot of no electronic stuff, is that's where our focus is at. It's actually back to where it should be, which is driver skill, right, is number one thing. Um, matter of fact, uh, we have uh, econo comp class. We don't allow a starting line rev limiter, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a lot of people get upset about that. Same thing we did Nostalgia Modified. No starting line rev limiter. Why? Because the engine would, they'd have to balance the engine RPM with their foot to sidestep the clutch. That was part of the driver's skill. And that was what the focus was, was to bring the driver back instead of letting the electronics run the show. One of the most traumatizing events in my life is when NHRA killed Modify. <laughs> right. You know, well, I, I'm serious about I, that. It was like, you know, no more sea gas. <laughs> oh, I know. I, and you know, the, the neatest thing was, they staged a protest at the U.S. Nationals and shut down the return road from at the U.S. Nationals. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people have already forgotten about that and are ready to just hug on up to NHRA trying to get a nostalgia modified or a modified class renewed. It's not going to happen. They, that ship sailed 1982. Yeah. Well, they, they've had a history. They, they, they've killed everything that was cool. You know? <laughs> well, for the sake of the dollar. No, seriously, you know, I mean, the top, top Gas was like one of the first things to go. It was another early childhood trauma of mine. They killed Top Gas in 1971. I was nine years old. And I was like, no more twin engine. Oh, you know, it was, it was terrible, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> and they, they killed Fuel Walter. They just neutered it and stuck it, you know. And, it, well, right. it got thrown in with Pro Comp, right? Right, right. So, um, you know, and, but, but that's, that's neither here nor there. The AHR is, is now here, revived, and ready to fix those. Yeah, those. Wounds. Errors in history. <laughs> errors in history, and make drag racing safe and cool for the average man again. Yeah, that's the whole average plan. person again. Was, so, the, the easy thing to do is come along with us. Whenever we drop a video, we're going to you go ahead and hit the subscribe button, yeah. and you'll get notified as soon as we drop another video. We're gonna, like we had said, discuss the history of the association. Well, this is well, okay, but, but that's kind of dry. Nobody really cares about the association. They care about the things that happen. Well, the pivotal points. The pivotal points, right? So, the, so the, what you're going to see on this channel is uh, basically drag racing history. You know, kind of through the lens of the AHRA, but not sp not exclusively, specifically AHRA. So, some of the topics that we've we've kicked around discussing are uh, well, like, for, like definitely the history of Lions Drag Strip because right. that was. You know. Yep, and it's ran under two banners. It ran under NHRA, then AHRA, then back to the NHRA. Right. But that was the most pivotal track in the AHRA history. Yeah. So that's why we're focused on it. Uh, slingshot drags. Everybody loves slingshot drags. I'm going to do a video on why people love slingshot drags. It's a, it's a <laughs> subliminal thing. Right, we talked about that. It's yeah, a, we did talk about it. Right? It was crazy when I told you about oh, that. Yeah, you know, I like, never thought of it like that. But now then you see it, right? Right, yeah. Okay. I do. Because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right? <laughs> okay, so that's a teaser. We'll get to that. Um, so we're going to talk about the evolution of the slingshot dragster. So 
What else? We were going to talk about clutches, the evolution of clutches in drag right. racing. You know, the the clutches, like, the reverser, two-speed. Right. Right? Because a lot of people don't know there was a two-speed. The evolution right. of the funny car. Uh, we could do something I'm intimately familiar with, the evolution of the Hemi. Oh, okay. From, you know, the, 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 the blown nitro Hemi from, from 1955. I'd love to cover topics. I mean, we could literally talk about stuff all day. And that's what we're going to do with this channel. We're going to talk about... Junior fuel. Junior yeah. fuel. I right? love it. Junior fuel. If you see you younger guys don't know about like there was a there was a there was a, a circuit called Jun that one of the title Junior Fuel. They were actually sea fuel dragsters. There was a three hundred and five cubic inch limit. These things, okay. Uh, and so just like just to just to give you like, an idea of the kind of material we're going to do, um, we'll get deep into these. In the middle nineteen sixties, later nineteen sixties, these things they were limited to three hundred and five cubic inches, and they weighed on average about a thousand pounds. You know the car. And uh, they were running over 200 miles an hour back then. Injected. Injected, right, no blower, just injected, sm mostly small block Chevys. There were a couple of small block Fords and whatnot mixed into it. But these things were so, in they were so stock. There was, a, there was one car, I, I'll show you this. It was a, a story in Drag Racing USA Magazine. It was like a, a, a detailed deal on, on one of these cars. And the only non-stock part on the engine, this was a, this was a 283 Chevy. The only non-stock part in the engine was the oil filter cartridge. Oh, because right. when they used the stock oil filter cartridge, it said AC Delco on it, and the nitro washed that off and it ended up in the oil pan. <laughs> so that's, these guys were going, back then they were going 200 miles an hour with stock 283 Chevys. So all of this stuff we want to definitely cover in depth right. on this channel. That's what we're going to be about here. Yeah. Focus specifically on the sportsman, regular, low buck racer. You yeah. know, the person that just wants to do it and have fun. With some nitro mixed in. For sure, but you can still do nitro and have fun. There's nothing stopping it. There's no such thing as nitro and have fun. <laughs> <laughs> There's nitro and PTSD. <laughs> There's no such thing as nitro and having fun. I tried. So, that's it. I think, I think we gave people an idea of what we're going to cover, yep. where things came from, and uh, where we're going to go. All right. So that's it, let's wrap this one up. Yeah, all right. Well, we look forward to seeing you. Like I said, hit subscribe. Uh, hit Uncle Tony's Garage, subscribe to that show. Yeah. And if you're not already. And every Wednesday night on my channel, Dallas and I do a Wednesday night live tech talk where we take tech questions and, well, we, we answer pretty anything. much anything that comes yeah. up. <laughs> right. So join us over there. Uh, that's that's it. it. See you next video. Yeah.